Uh, just a small word to thank our different uh, our different sponsors. Uh, so Calcul Quebec is actually composed of different institutions. Uh, some of these institutions you might be part of. Uh, so Calcul Quebec is a is not even a nonprofit. It's currently a research project uh, of different uh, university and institutions. Uh, who share resources, share computing resources, but share mostly staff resources that can answer your questions and help you with your research project in order to use those advanced research computing uh, resources that we are going to uh, see uh, today. Uh, so I, I'm, I, entirely, uh, I, I put that title up, uh, Calcul Quebec, as your digital lab. So once you have, you're done with your traditional uh, laboratory work in, in a physical lab. Now you're, uh, you're ready to do some digital work. Uh, we imagine that the resources that are available in Compute Canada and the Quebec can be seen as some form of a digital lab that is actually uh, approachable and open to almost like anyone who has any form of computing needs. And we're going to cover that today. So it's uh, the, uh, the, the presentation, the, the slot, currently today was entitled high performance computing. I'm trying to leave that terminology aside and go more for advanced research computing as high performance computing is generally dedicated to using like tens and thousands of cores uh, while just using maybe something more than your own personal computer. You're starting to do advanced research computing and you are welcome to use our uh, infrastructures in, uh, in Calcut Quebec and in Compute Canada. So uh, this is how we shape our, uh, our workshop or our presentations today. Uh, instead of having bullet points, I prefer to have some form of a user experience map where we're going to start here as becoming aware. Uh, and what I mean by that is that finding out, becoming uh, aware that you're having uh, problems or you having needs that require uh, advanced research computing. So uh, I, this is the first time I'm giving that workshop uh, live from my uh, from 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 home. So uh, normally I would ask you to like raise your hand. Have you ever seen this in your lab? So you can raise your hand at home. Uh, you must have seen at some point uh, in your lab or in <laughs> uh, where you are dedicating some computer in your lab to just, please don't touch it. I'm doing something very, very important uh, for the next hours or days. Uh, and I'm, finger crossed, I'm hoping for not having any sort of uh, power issues or an undergrad that I actually want to do like Facebook on that, on that computer and ruin days of computing. Uh, if, you are, if you have seen that or if you have, created that post-it or you have stick that post-it on, on that display, you are actually, you, you need advanced, you're doing advanced research computing and you might need uh, Compute Canada and Calcul Quebec resources. So what do we define as advanced research computing? It's pretty basic. Uh, any computation that actually make an intensive usage of computing resources. So, and what we mean by intense uh, computing resources that could be anything, right? Uh, it could be you're missing, uh, you're using intensively your CPU. Uh, you need a lot of RAM. You need a lot of storage to put out all your MRI images, or you need a lot of time. Uh, with a single CPU, you're, with your only uh, computer at home, uh, at, at the office, you estimate that you have days or months or even years of computing in order to publish your result, uh, you are doing advanced research computing. And again, you might benefit from using our, uh, our, our resources and our infrastructure. Uh, so why, again, why would you be doing ARC? It's generally to, uh, as JB was uh, cornering, uh, cornering quite well, uh, it's in order to maybe push back what you would normally be able to do in terms of questions. Uh, what kind of question can you ask your data? What kind of question can you ask your simulation? And one of the example that I like to, to show just to, uh, to give an idea is that uh, you might have seen the, the movie Interstellar. 
uh, during the movie at some point, uh, they are, we, are, we are being shown images of a black hole. Now, you can, you can imagine that uh, the, the director of Interstellar couldn't go in space and just film a black hole. Uh, I'm pretty sure that at any point in human history, we won't be able to do that. But still, uh, we want, they wanted to provide images of, of the black hole. So in order to do that, they did computer simulation. And not only did they do computer simulation, but they did computer simulation backed by sciences. And actually, the, the images that you see in Interstellar are uh, eventually were published in a reviewed work in scientific, uh, in scientific, uh, well, in scientific journals uh, about black holes, and you can actually see uh, black actual science uh, in in the movies just through a digital simulation and what they actually and i like those images because what they actually use in order to do those simulations are infrastructures that are comparable to what we can find in compute canada so if your experiments are judged too complex in terms of cost complexity or time uh you might want to use advanced research computing to alleviate those barriers that are potentially just virtual uh, some so some more uh, ground uh, scientific uh, example of why or how our infrastructures are currently using Compute Canada. Uh, we have like two great categories of, uh, of users: uh, those who have like complex problems, so genome assembly, molecular dynamics, genomic pipeline, everything related to bioinformatics is pretty much uh, complex problems, but they also have a lot of data. So you, are, you want to do machine learning, big data analytics, you want tons of computes, tons of the GPUs, you want to do image processing, you're actually doing uh, advanced research computing. So now you, are, you're, you might be aware, uh, you might already, as I was talking, you might have already uh, identified a problem in your research where you say, yes, I don't have enough computing power. My computer is burning right now just in order to crunch my data. I would like to use that computer to redact my thesis and let some other people computer actually do the work. So now you want to do advanced research computing. In order to do that, you will need to create an account. So there are two, so if you are in an institution in uh, the province of Quebec, there are two uh, major player uh, that works actually together. The first is Compute Canada, and the second is Calcul Quebec. So we're going to cover which is which. Uh, so Compute Canada is a national organization. It's, in fact, it's actually really a shell. Uh, it's, it facilitates the interaction between the different uh, regional partners, uh, which and one of them is Calcul Quebec. So Compute Canada itself have around like probably five administrative uh, staff and another five technical staff. Uh, the rest of the Compute Canada organization, which includes around 200 uh, people, is actually composed of the regional partners, and Calcul Quebec is one of these uh, one of the uh, regional partners. So what do we offer as Calcul Quebec or Compute Canada? First of all, uh, we do offer infrastructures, so physical uh, material that you cannot access directly to the physical thing, but through the internet, you can connect to our supercomputing in order to, add to, or to our supercomputing in order to get access to GPUs. Uh, we have cloud storage. And uh, on the other hand, if you have no idea on how to use those resources or you would like some help or you want to optimize your code in order to better use these infrastructures, we also offer uh, some expertise. So in our, the four uh, funding universities that are part of Calco Quebec, that would be Université de Sherbrooke, Université Laval, uh, McGill University, and Université de Montréal, uh, you found actual staff, so around 10 persons uh, per university that can help you with, uh, with, with your code in order to uh, use those infrastructures. Uh, we also have some staff uh, that actually manage the supercomputers and make sure that they run well. 
Uh, we offer all sorts of services, uh, software consulting, infrastructure consulting, and most the, the, the one of the most seat after uh, service is our training. So we do offer specialist training as I'm doing today, but we also offer uh, regularly some, some training online now online uh, about the different uh, software that we have uh, available in our infrastructures. Uh, this is what a data center could look like uh, if you want to see one, because that's as uh, probably as close as you're going to get to our data center. Uh, you cannot, you don't, and you don't want uh, physical access to our data center. Everything is going to go through the internet in order to access those systems. Uh, just a quick comparison of what, what you might want to get, uh, what, what you might get by actually going into uh, Compute Canada computers. Uh, normally for your computer, you would have two to 12 cores. Now two is, it's picking rarer and rarer. Uh, you might have four cores, uh, four to 32 gigabytes of memory. Uh, a network, if you're lucky and you're doing Bell Fiber, you might have one gigabit network. Uh, now, if we compare that to our, uh, our, our a single node, so uh, one supercomputer is composed of multiple nodes. And uh, for example, the last computer that was uh, deployed at uh, Ecole de Technologie Supérieure in Montreal has around, I would say, probably 800 to 900 nodes. Uh, so a single compute node is generally around four to six times uh, the amount of power that you will find in your single own personal computer. So just by, if your code permits it, uh, just by deploying it on a single compute node of uh, Beluga, for example, which is the Montreal supercomputer, uh, you might get a better performance. You might get more power in order to boost your research. And that's just one compute node. Now, as I said, a Beluga uh, supercomputer is composed of six, up to probably more than 600 of those compute nodes. So you potentially have access to over 35,000 cores and terabytes and terabytes of memory. Now, uh, in order to use all of, to use more than one node, you will need some form of special programming. And this is when you might want to refer to our staff. But this is just to give you some idea of the amplitude of our deployment and what kind of power that you might, uh, you might be able to access. Uh, when I was talking about a compute node, this is what it looks like. So our, a compute node typically don't have any fans. Uh, the actual airflow goes through the, the compute node and uh, cool whatever uh, devices and uh, elements that are in, in those compute nodes. Uh, one thing that, I'm, that I forgot to mention in my, uh, in my slide is that Compute Canada and Calcul Quebec services for academia is entirely free. So when you actually create an account in Compute Canada, it is free. Uh, it is free for your, uh, your, your, uh, your principal instigator or your, uh, your advisor. And uh, we'll see how we can create an account, but all of this, it is free. Uh, our staff helping you, our access, the access to our supercomputer, Everything is free, everything is being paid for by your institution and the different level of governments. Uh, so in order to interact with our ARC clusters, you have to go through what we uh, call an interactive node or more typically we call it a uh, login node. So in order to access to a login node, you will always go through the internet. Uh, the interactive node or the login node is directly accessible to the internet. So wherever you are in the world, uh, you will be able to access to Compute Canada infrastructures. Uh, so if you don't already have an account, uh, as a PhD student, as a master's student, as a student in general, the first step is actually to go knock on your uh, your advisor door and say, hey, 
I need Compute Canada. Do you have an account? If they don't, they will need to go on ccdb.computecanada.ca and open an account. It's uh, fairly easy. It will take them like, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. And uh, again, it is free. They don't have to enter their credit card number. Uh, everything is everything's free. Now, uh, if once your, uh, your, your advisor has actually created an account, uh, they will need to provide you some information. So that information is called the CCRI for Compute Canada something identifier. Uh, I don't remember what the R stands for. So your sponsor is going to give you that unique identifier. And this is what you're going to be able to fill in the form that will associate your actual, your own Compute Canada uh, account to the one of your advisor. Uh, if at some point your advisor actually asks you, do I have a limit? There is no actual limit. So your advisor can sponsor as many uh, students as he has. Uh, it's, it's no issue. Uh, I think currently uh, one of the biggest PI in Compute Canada has around 250 uh, sponsored account, and that is Joshua, Joshua Benjo. So there's, there's no limit. Uh, ideally, the sponsor should have a direct link of uh, advising with, with his sponsored student. Uh, you can also have, uh, API could also have external collaborators. Uh, that is not an issue, and that's, that's a possibility inside uh, Compute Canada, but a PI should always be a professor in a Canadian institutions. Uh, so if you want to create an account, here's our, the, 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 the optional step. Uh, the sixth step is actually no longer relevant. Uh, so once you have, uh, in, in the past, when you were actually affiliated with a regional partner, you would also get a uh, regional partner account. Uh, and in order to log in, to connect to a supercomputer that is provided by a regional partner, you would use that regional partner account. This is no longer true. Uh, once you get your Compute Canada account, you can connect to every supercomputer in Canada, except one, uh, because they are special. Uh, University of Toronto with Niagara, uh, I've decided that you need to request access to the supercomputer. You will be able to act, connect to Niagara with your Compute Canada username, but in order to access Niagara, you will have to ask. Uh, for all other uh, supercomputers, when you have a valid Compute Canada account, you can connect directly. What you actually get access with that account are uh, a reasonable amount of resources. Uh, we'll see how you get access to those resources. But if at some point you find out that you don't have enough resources available to you, once a year, uh, Compute Canada actually organize a, what they call a resource allocation competition. And that's when your actual, uh, your, your sponsor, your adv advisor has to become more involved because in order to get more resources, you have to apply in a competition and ask for resources and justify their need for, for, those, for those resources through their actual science and through the, uh, the, uh, the different scientific articles that were published. So they will have to explain their science, your project, in order to get more resources. This happens only once a year. Uh, and if you start, um, most of the time, a single year of access to a one of our or all of our supercomputers is sufficient. Eventually, as you get used to using those computers, you might want to uh, go for the competition to access to more, uh, to more power. Uh, our system in order to create accounts is not perfect. It is not probably as streamlined as other big companies that would get like, for example, AWS or, uh, or Google Cloud. But you have to remember this service is free, so you have to be zen, you have to be patient. Uh, so there's going to be a few exchange of emails uh, in order to create your account. 
mostly for your advisor. And you have to like, maybe if it's been a week, you have your ask your account and you had no use, you had no news. Maybe you should just knock on your uh, advisor door and say, uh, have you checked your spam folder? Because maybe Compute Canada has confirmed your account there. So it takes time. Uh, we're going uh, physically, uh, one of our staff is actually going to validate your PI account and your own account. So it takes some time, but in around 48 hours, you should get access to your supercomputer. Uh, if you don't currently have a Compute Canada account, but you expect in the year that you might need some computing resources and you expect actually that you're going to publish a paper and you might need computing resources to publish those, crunch those final numbers and publish and build the, the final results that put your, your article together. Don't wait two weeks before uh, your, the, the final uh, submission of your paper to ask a Compute Canada account. Ask for one next week. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, it just take a few minutes of your, uh, your advisor and your own time in order to get, to get that account. And in order to get that, to keep that account alive, once a year, you just have to say, yes, I'm still, I'm still a PhD student. Yes, uh, this student is still, is still part of my lab and I still want to get access to Compute Canada. That's how much effort you would need. Just once a year, we do renew all of the accounts. So if you think you might need Compute Canada at some point in, in the coming week, just ask for an account and you will get one and it will be there once you need it. There's no cost associated with it. Now, it's all, it's all cool. Uh, now, we know, uh, we know that we might be uh, having some, uh, so we might have some issues with our, uh, that in our research that, that need computing power. Uh, we now know where we can get actual computing resources for free, which is pretty exceptional. Uh, if you go, there's, uh, pre, there's a few consortia in, in Europe that offer, uh, equivalent, uh, equivalent services, but it's pretty exceptional in Canada that around all Canada, uh, you can actually uh, access supercomputer for free, regardless of your experience. As long as you are in academia, you can actually access our supercomputer. Uh, and we now know how you can create an account. So now the, the following question is how we can actually access those systems, how we can actually connect to those systems. Currently in Compute Canada, we have uh, three uh, what we call general purpose uh, supercomputer. And by general purpose, we mean if you need a single compute node, just a few cores, or you need a whole bunch of nodes, uh, these clusters might be uh, suited for you. There is a, so we have a general purpose cluster, we have three general purpose cluster, and we have a single, what we call, large uh, processing uh, parallel cluster, which is Niagara, which is the special one that you asked to ask for. Uh, the, re the difference between uh, the, the three more common uh, general purpose cluster and the largely parallel cluster is that on Cedar, Dram, or Beluga, you can, act, when you actually run your program, you can run your program, for example, on a single core one CPU, one processor in your as multiple cores, and you could ask for only one if you'd like. If this is only what you need, a single core is okay. When you're looking for Niagara, uh, you actually, what they call large parallel is that they expect you to actually use at least a single node in a single node is composed of, I think a single node of Niagara is composed of 48 cores. So you would have to use absolutely those 48 cores when you're running your program. So if your program does not, your, your code does not scale on more than two or four cores, Niagara is not for you. Why do, it, do they call it largely parallel? Is that 48 cores is the bare minimum. 
if you'd like what they would like you to do ideally is to use 10 20 40 times 48 cores and use more nodes because all of those nodes are connected with a special network that make, make it like very uh, communication between the nodes very very fast and with very small latency as it, and it make it as it was a single computer from a performance point of view but from a programming point of view you would need to do a lot of pro specialized programming in order to take advantage of that architecture so if you're just starting with supercomputing stay with those three cedar cream or beluga those uh those three supercomputers are hosted by different regional partners cedar is in uh, Simon Fraser University, Graham is in Waterloo, and Beluga is uh, in Montreal at Ecole Technologie Super. With a Compute Canada account, you can choose whatever you like. Uh, and one of these three super, all of these three supercomputers are accessible to you, and you can use the three of them. You can use this one, two, or uh, it's however you like. Uh, how how would you choose one of those supercomputers? They are mostly the same, to be honest, and uh, we are trying to upgrade them as much as possible uh, as time goes by and as we get more uh, more money from the government in order to expand our facilities. So, what uh, if if you don't know about those supercomputers? Just we have some documentation online on our wiki, which is uh, accessible to docs.computecanada.ca. Uh, and you can go look at the spec of Graham or Beluga. But if you're not that computer savvy about hardware, and to be honest, I'm becoming more and more, more less and less savvy about hardware as it's evolving, uh, you might not get much information as to which supercomputer to choose. Uh, so the, the major, uh, the, the most common ways to actually select the supercomputer that you, that you would like to use. And the one that I'm mostly suggesting people that ask me that question is, well, choose the server that your lab is actually using. So if, uh, so all of these supercomputers have their own file system. So if you'd like there is no connection between the file system of Beluga and Gram. So if your files are on Gram and you would like to access them on Beluga, you will have to transfer them. But if your, uh, your lab partner is also on Gram and you would like to share some file uh, as part of the same lab, you can actually, you already actually share a folder that, and you can share your data there. So this is why, one of the reasons that we mostly see lab sharing the, or using the same supercomputer is because they are actually sharing file sharing scripts uh and all of that still unsure you can always contact us uh, through an email and ask us and define for example your context or what you would like to do and whatever and we, we'll try to to help you uh find the best computer uh We'll cover that a bit later, but just to give you an idea, all of these supercomputers uh, before, if, if, we had, if I had presented you that workshop 10 years ago, I would have said, well, you could, one of the other point that uh, in order to choose a supercomputer would be, well, choose the supercomputer on which your so the software that you might want to run is available. And that's no longer true because all supercomputers in Compute Canada actually share the exact same softwares, uh, except for uh, commercial softwares. So for example, some license uh, required uh, software. Otherwise, all software are available on all supercomputers in Canada. We'll cover uh, how and we, how we did it a bit later and how you can actually access those software. But this is, this is not a problem. So you don't have to choose a supercomputer based on the software that you will want to use. So as I said, uh, when we want to connect to a supercomputer, we're going to use the internet and we're going to use a special uh, client or a special 
tool in order to connect to our supercomputer. And that tool is called uh, SSH for an uh, SSH stand for secure shell. So in order to connect to a uh, Compute Canada supercomputer, at the moment, you have to use the shell. You, you, ha you will have to enter some commands as you did on, uh, on yesterday's or on this morning uh, lesson on bash. You will need to use some bash because when you connect to a Compute Canada supercomputer, uh, you actually open a terminal on a remote computer and talk to that computer through the terminal. Uh, if you're using a Mac or a Linux computer, you already have all the tool already installed on your computer available through the terminal. So you will just, if you haven't already, and you probably did because yesterday you did some bash, uh, you will need to open a terminal. If you're using Windows, uh, you could uh, use what we call, uh, there's, there's a tutorial there, uh, Mobile Xterm is a a uh, graphical tool that provide a terminal to connect to remote computers. Uh, you, if you are using Windows uh, subsystem for Linux, you could also have SSH installed there. And there's a third option. You could also use what we call PuTTY SSH to connect to your supercomputer. Uh, so, and so if you're using Mac or Linux, or you have some form of terminal, in order to connect to our supercomputer, you will use the command SSH space, your username. So uh, I've provided uh, a spreadsheet with the username that you will, uh, that we, you will use today. Uh, then it's uh, a commercial. So this is just uh, this, this is just a con this is a convention to uh, separate the username and the actual uh, server name. So you, you will always use the a commercial and the name of the uh, the actual address of the server. So if you wanted to connect to Beluga and your username was I don't know uh, Narval, for example, uh, you would do ssh narval at uh, beluga.computecanada.ca. And when you press enter, it will ask for your Compute Canada password, which you enter, and eventually you get an actual terminal on uh, the remote computer, which is Cedar, Graham, or Beluga. Uh, now, we're going to do our first hands on part of that workshop. Uh, you're going to if you are on Mac on Linux, you are going to fire uh, your terminal. If you are on Windows, you can fire PuTTY, uh, download Mobile Xterm, or start Windows uh, subsystem for Linux, or Sigwin, or if you have, you can choose your own if you already know how to have an uh, SSH access to uh, through your Windows computer. Just go ahead, you can use that. And in order to connect to the following uh, virtual computer, you will use the username that is available in the spreadsheet associated with your name. So if, for example, you are user 89, you will enter SSH space user 89, a commercial brain.calculquebec.cloud. Uh, you will say, well, brain is not a supercomputer that was mentioned in your previous slide, Felix. What is that? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, so Brain is actually a virtual cluster that I've created specifically for a brain hack. Uh, so as part of my uh, Compute Canada uh, work, uh, in the past two years, I've actually developed a project that allow uh, the complete reproduction of a Compute Canada software environment in the cloud. So we no longer need, when we are doing training, we no longer need to provide you direct access to our very in-demand uh, supercomputer, especially in that moment of uh, COVID-19 where there's a tons of researchers asking for more resources on our system. But one of the supercomputer that I haven't mentioned is Arbitus. Arbitus is Compute Canada Cloud. So brain.calculquebec.cloud is a virtual cluster running on an actual cloud supercomputer 
which is our bitters. Uh, and when we connect to that, uh, to that supercomputer brain.calculator cloud, we will get the same actual software experience that we would get on a uh, typical classical Compute Canada supercomputer. Uh, you will, as since we get all the same software all around across Canada. Uh, I'm gonna go for a chat uh, to see if there's any question and we're going to try to connect to the supercomputer uh, afterward. Uh, Tamir was asking, if I have a Seabrain account, can I log in with the same account to Compute Canada? Those are separate account, except if you buy a Seabrain, you mean Seabrain does have a Compute Canada uh, research, uh, uh, research allocation. Uh, so uh, that, that might be related, but otherwise you would need an actual Compute Canada account. Uh, do all the servers give access to GPU space? Uh, all three general purpose uh, cluster currently have GPUs. Uh, they have different kinds of GPUs. Uh, so Cedar and Graham were the first deploy in Canada. So they uh, add uh, older version of NVIDIA GPUs. Currently, I think the most recent GPUs are available almost everywhere since they were new expansion, but you can see on the wiki uh, and look if the GPU that you would like to use is available in the supercomputer that uh, you would like to use. Uh, currently on Beluga, you have V100 and you will have V100 on Cedar and Gram too, I think. But as I said, on Cedar and Gram, you will also have uh, P100 and I think they have deployed T4s on Graham. Can international collaborators on our project have access to these resources? Uh, yes, they can actually as long, uh, but they will have to be sponsored by your PI. So you can, uh, if your PI is, uh, wants to actually sponsor those international collaborators, they can actually get access to Compute Canada resources. They cannot just, but international collaborators always have to go through sponsors. Uh, they cannot directly ask for a Compute Canada account as a researcher, for example. Uh, what if user needs a specific version of a package since they don't have sudo access? That's a great question. Uh, since uh, when you connect to Compute Canada system, you cannot inst you will be able to install software in your own account, uh, in your own folder, but not as, for example, you won't be able to do sudo apt apt. Uh, APT install something. Uh, in order to install uh, scientific software, what we mostly recommend is uh, you send us an email and say, uh, I want to use that software that is currently not available on your system uh, for this and this research. And generally in the coming week, we have it installed on all system at the same time. Uh, you won't be able to use Docker directly on our system uh, because Docker needs a, what we, we, we call a uh, service daemon that is running as root. And that is, not, uh, that is a security issue that we are not uh, ready to risk uh, on our uh, high performance computing system. But we have an alternative. If you have a Docker image or a Docker file, uh, you can use the uh, you can use a tool called Singularity that will be able to run that Docker image on our system. So if you absolutely need some package installed to APT or YUM or something, or you need to use a Docker file, you can always res uh, you can always use Singularity in order to run that image on our system. Uh, but most of the time the software that you want is already installed on our, uh, on our, in our software stack. Uh, at the moment, we're talking about, uh, I think over 2000 softwares that were installed on all our system at the same time. Uh, we will see once you connect to uh, brain.calculquebec.cloud, you will be able to list all of the available softwares and you, that, that pretty much should convince yourself that your software is already there. Uh, singularity, yes. What's the password? Excellent question. So uh, I'm going to 
share on Slack the password. No. All right. Uh, so you can go in general on Slack and uh, copy and paste that password when it is asked uh, you for that password. I'm going to share, I'm going to sh make a new share and give you a demonstration on how you can actually, what it would be like to connect to brain share. All right. So I'm on a uh, Windows system because of the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> this is my personal home computer. Uh, normally I would be on a Mac, but because since I'm at home, my gaming PC became my actual work computer. So I'm on Windows. Uh, but I'm using a uh, Windows subsystem. So I would be, uh, it would be similar if you use uh, any sort of terminal. As I said, we will use SSH to connect to our uh, system. So I'll enter a command SSH followed by my username. So I'm going to pick one of the last username that hasn't been assigned to anyone. User, for example, 80, a commercial, brain.calculquebec.cloud. It asks for your, uh, for your password. So you're going to paste your password. Now you might ask, Felix, it hasn't shown anything on screen. There is, there is no star, There's, there was nothing. What happened? Uh, so SSH is so secure that it doesn't even show that you're typing on screen in case someone's actually looking over your shoulder. So if it was your first experience with SSH and you were actually wondering what you're typing and you keep on typing and eventually you press enter and it said wrong password and you, well, but I haven't entered any password. Well, it's because SSH does not actually show you anything when you actually type a password. Uh, if, for example, you have entered three times a bad password because you were so impatient for me to actually paste the password on Slack, or you did the, uh, there's no password being shown on screen, I'm typing like everything that I know, uh, and now I cannot connect. There's something called fail to ban running on the virtual cluster. And it is also running on all of our, uh, on all of our uh, Compute Canada cluster. So it's a good experience. If it actually happened to you, and I'll, I'll go look if it happened to you, you might have banned yourself from the virtual cluster by entering a bad password too many times. Uh, this is common. Uh, this happens all the time. Uh, this is up all the time with Compute Canada cluster, and I prefer you to actually go through that experience on a virtual cluster than on an actual Compute Canada system. It has no actual uh, impact except yourself. Uh, in a uh, regular workshop, the effect that a, such a ban would have is to actually, you might, by entering a bad password three times, you might have also banned all of the other people sharing the same internet with you in the same room. Uh, so it's just, just the access to the virtual cluster. Since we are all connecting to a different provider, uh, all to, uh, we are all at home or somewhere uh, with a different IP address, uh, we, we couldn't be banned by just a single person. But on a Compute Canada cluster, this can happen. If you're physically in the same lab and you're sharing the same IP address when you connect to a Compute Canada cluster and you enter a, the wrong password too many times, fail to ban. So the system that detects the uh, bad entering of a password too many times actually share your IP address. So the IP address is just a number that uh, identify yourself on the internet and uh, 
if it is banned, it is banned. Uh, that ban is generally only uh, for an hour or so. So if you if you're being banned from the virtual cluster, I will unban you in the following minutes. Uh, if you've been banned on the Compute Canada cluster and you don't want to wait an hour, uh, you can always send an email to support at computecanada.ca. Uh, it might happen that we do not answer you uh, in on under an hour, so too bad. Uh, you, you're going to get your your account back in, in an hour. Uh, but if uh, we actually see your password, we might unban you uh, just in time and you get back your, your access. Uh, when you, we were actually connecting to our supercomputer, we use a password. Uh, some people uh, would prefer to use what we call RSE key or SSH keys. Uh, we will not cover that uh, today, but you can go on Compute Canada Wiki and look for SSH keys. And the advantage of a key is it's a file on your personal computer uh, that you shouldn't share with anyone for the private part. So a key is composed of two parts, public and a private key. You shouldn't share a private key with anyone uh, since it's the equivalent of having a password in a file. Uh, but that file, that private key file is actually being read automatically by the SSH client. And it can be used to connect to a cluster or a server on which you have written your public key. Uh, so if you want to know more, go look at uh, the Compute Canada Wiki. But uh, this is uh, our, our first uh, experience. And the advantage of the, the, uh, the of SSH key is that you cannot get your password wrong since uh, SSH is actually reading a file and using that file to connect to the cluster. Uh, it is not as secure if you're uh, just leaving the uh, private key unencrypted on your, uh, in your, uh, on your computer, but you can actually encrypt that file and have a password to decrypt that file. But all right, that's about it. Uh, could everyone that were able to connect to brain.calculquebec.clouds raise their hand on uh, Zoom? so I can get a count of how many participants actually were able to connect. There's, I think, if, if you want, don't want to say yes, uh, I think on Zoom there is a like raise your hand button and that gave me a count, that's easier. If you need assistance, I think one of our uh, very smart TAs can actually help you uh, through Slack or Zoom or a private break room or something. Uh, but that's what we just did. Uh, if you if you had a Compute Canada account, you would uh, you would be able to connect just uh, as we did to a uh, uh, to, to a Compute Canada cluster. That is the exact same. And when we actually have a secure shell, we have a remote shell on another person's computer. Uh, so. It, we can now type some uh, bash commands. So for example, ls to list file, and the actual file system that you are going to use, uh, that you are going to see the uh, architecture and you, the, the, the folders uh, structures, you're going to find it as is on a Compute Canada cluster, just with uh, different names for the groups or uh, for your username, for example. The folder, for example, that would be shared among uh, your group is uh, in projects, we have sponsor 00. So as all, all of us currently in this workshop, we share the same sponsor named sponsor 00. Uh, so if we do an actual LS of this sponsor 00, we actually show the content of a folder that is shared among all of, our, all of us. So if I do, for example, if I create a file in project F sponsor 00, 
if on your side of the internet, uh, wait, touch file. If on your side of the internet, you do an actual LS of project dev sponsor zero zero, you will also see that file. So if I wanted to share a file with all of you, I would just put it in projects dev sponsor zero zero. Uh, if, as you can see, if I do an LS projects, uh, it's uh, dev sponsor zero zero is not blue, it's more aqua. Uh, because it's an actual, it's a symbolic link to a project folder that is in slash project. Uh, I won't get too far ahead on, on that, but just know that how can other users access your actual own folder? It's because it's not actually your own folder. It's just a sim link to some file uh, residing on the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the root uh, of the file system. Once we are connected to a Compute Canada or a virtual cluster, uh, what we get is a pretty naked file system, right? We, uh, we have seen just a project and a scratch folder, but there is, there's no file. Uh, what was the last comment again? And what does it mean? Uh, the last comment was ls, and it means list. Just list the file of the on the current folder. Uh, close the chat. So, when we connect to a supercomputer, uh, we have, as I said, we have a pretty much a naked file system. We don't have our data we will want to actually copy uh, some, of the, some of the data, some of the program, install some program. So we will want to adapt, uh, personalize, customize our actual account on, on, the, on the cluster. So in order to do that, we'll need to do some configuring, moving files. So that's the next step in our uh, typical user experience. Uh, in order to do some configuration, once you are connected to our system, uh, as I've shown, you actually have access to all of the bash command that were uh, teach to you in, in the last two days. So PWD for print printing directory, LS to list files. You can change directory as you would like. Uh, you can create new directory as long as it is in some folder which you can write in. Uh, by default, when you connect with SSH to our system, you end up in your home and in your home, you can do whatever you like. Uh, you can copy files and you can remove files. But what if the file that you would like to access is currently on your own computer? Uh, in order to copy files from your computer to a virtual cluster or a computer Canada cluster, uh, you will use what we call secure copy. Uh, you might see some something close to SSH, SH, right? Uh, well, we have the equivalent for copy, so secure copy. And how does it work? Uh, secure copy, the first argument will be uh, the name of the file that you want to copy and the second argument would be the target, where you want to copy that file. So if the file is currently on your computer and you would like to copy it on the cluster, you would do SCP, the path to the file, and if the file is currently in, is in your uh, current working directory, you can enter the name of the file directly, followed by the destination, the target. Uh, SCP, you could copy another, a file on your own computer if you like, uh, just by, as you would do for copy. But if you want to do it on the remote computer, you will need to provide the same information as you provided secure shell. So your username, a commercial, the name of the server, but there's, and there's a but, you'll see there's a column at the end. 
do not forget it. The column is to actually tell secure copy that this is this part username at a server is an actual remote computer and not a file that you are trying to create on your own computer. If you forget the column, what's going to happen is that secure copy is going to create a copy of fichier.txt on your own computer. And the name of that file will be user a commercial server.computecanada.ca. And that's generally not what you want. So don't forget the column at the end. And the column can also be used as a separator to tell where the file should end up. So if you are doing uh, after the column, what you can provide is an actual is the path to where you want to copy your file. If you don't provide any path, the, the file is going to cop be copied directly in uh, your own folder. So as an exercise to get uh, accustomed to uh, secure copy, what you can do is actually download this file. Uh, so this is a short link uh, to a zip file containing the exercise that you will uh, have to work with during the, this afternoon. So first step, copy that uh, shortcut or that uh that link in your web browser i'm going to paste it in slack there you go uh once it is downloaded on uh, your own computer you will want to ideally to practice scp uh you will want to use scp so the, the name of the file, if you download it, will be uh, CQ, I think, uh, something for French saying uh, first step uh, on our servers, uh, .zip. Your username at brain.calcodequebec.cloud, colon. Uh, if, you're, uh, if the file you downloaded is not in your current working directory, you can change directory until you are, for example, in downloads, or you can actually specify SCP downloads something. I'm going to show it to you on the terminal uh, afterward. If you don't have access to SCP for some reason or uh, you're feeling lazy and you will just like to download it directly on the cluster, and that might happen. Uh, if at some point you need data, uh, on the supercomputer, but that does, that data does not reside on your computer. Uh, it's on the internet somewhere. Uh, know that you can always download files directly on a supercomputer from the internet without first downloading it on your own personal laptop or on your personal computer. Uh, one of the commands uh, available to download from a website is called curl. Uh, there's another one on uh, Ubuntu. I think it's called WGET. But uh, curl, you, you're pretty, you're mostly certain to find it everywhere, uh, and it's available in a virtual cluster. So if you want to download the file directly without doing going through SCP, you can say curl uh, minus l uh, uppercase l. That's for following link. So if the link you're trying to access is actually redirecting you to somewhere else. Curl is going to follow it. Uh, dash O is for the name of the file that you want to create. Uh, uppercase O would just use uh, whatever uh, was in the URL. Since it's a shortcut, the name of the file will be a bit mangled, so uh, we won't do it. Uh, so And followed by the actual uh, URL that you would like to use. So I'm uh, even myself. I'm pretty uh, using pretty uh, oftenly that command our supercomputer to get data. Uh, for example, to download uh, GitHub archives or uh, data packages uh, from the internet. I'm most often using curl directly on the uh, on the supercomputer instead of first downloading uh, through my web browser. Uh, the file on uh, my 
personal computer and just do, then then doing scp uh that's just a waste of time and space i'm just downloading the file directly uh so we're going to i'm going to download a file and i'm going to share uh my uh, i'm going to share my screen my terminal to give you an example so all right i'm currently on the virtual cluster and i would like to copy the file from my own computer in order to do that i need to leave the supercomputer or i need to create a new terminal that is on my uh personal pc why is that your personal computer is not, or should not at least, be available from the internet. You don't want everyone to be able to connect to your computer directly from the internet. Uh, that is, we do it for a cluster because it's convenient to our users, but your own personal computer should be only, mostly only be accessed by you through a physical mean. So, Normally, the supercomputer cannot access your own computer by going through the internet. So in order to copy a file, you have to be on your own computer and copy that file to the supercomputer. So I'm going to leave the supercomputer. In order to leave SSH, you have two choices. You can do control D or you could type exit and you'll go back to your own computer. So I'm currently on my computer. Uh, I'm going to move the file uh, named CQ Formation Premier Pas Slurm Cloud. So this is the file I've downloaded from my web browser. Uh, this is will this will be different uh, for you, but this is just because I'm using uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, that I had to do this, but otherwise, normally, if I do this, if I go on downloads, uh, if I was in my home on my own computer and I had downloaded a file, uh, it would probably appear in downloads. So if I want to copy that file on the virtual cluster, I'm going to type SCP the path to the file. So if I'm not already in a folder of the file that I want to copy, I can either change directory or provide the, the path direct to the, uh, to the actual file that I want to copy uh, in either relatively or absolute. So I'm going to do a relative path. So SCP downloads. And in order to type downloads pretty fast, you don't see my hands, but I didn't know types all of those letters. I'm using auto completion. So you might have seen that in bash, but it's always a good reminder. If you are typing maybe half of your word or just a, a few first letter, uh, you can just press, you can press tab afterward and the terminal is going to auto complete uh, your, uh, whatever you were trying to type. So SCP downloads, and then the name of the file that you would like to copy. So CQ dash, and again, I'm using type to auto complete it. So we would like to copy that file as, in my case, user 80, please, your, please use your own uh, username that was, was assigned to you through this, the spreadsheet. Since we all share the same password, uh, you wouldn't be able to uh, we, we would be able to actually cross copy through our uh, user folder. We don't want that. So use the username. So don't type what exactly I'm typing. Adapt to whatever system you're, uh, you're working with and your actual username. As I said, I'm user 80. A commercial, the name of the server. So brain.calcoquebec.cloud. And don't forget the column, but let's forget the column. I'm going to forget the column deliberately just to give you an example. No error. 
uh, there's no mistake, no error. Uh, I could think that actually I've copied that file, but if I do an ls, oh no, there is a file named user ad at brain dot uh, and that's that's not good. That's not what I wanted to do. So I'm going to remove that file and do it again. So downloads, CQ, user ad at brain.calcoquebec.cloud, colon. And I just entering the colon, I know that I'm going to copy that file in my home folder. It has for my password. I'm going to go in Slack, copy, enter. And you get a, so if the file were really big, uh, you would get like a nice progress of the transfer. And what we get is the amount of data that was transferred and uh, at what speed. As I said, after the colon, uh, it, it is uh, a path where we want to actually copy the file. So if I wanted to share that file with every one of you, uh, I would use the project folder, right? So I can do it again because I can copy file all day long if I want to. Brain.calco.quebec.cloud, colon. And then I can use uh, a relative path, and uh, the path is relative to my own folder. But I can also give an absolute path. So I can do, and this path only exists on the remote computer. So I'm going to say own user 80 projects def sponsor zero zero. It's going to ask for my password again. Copy it. And now, if I connect to brain.calculquebec.cloud, it has format. You see, this is why we need keys. This is why we use SSH keys. It's because at some point, we are getting tired of entering our password. All right, so in my own folder, I now have a red file. Uh, the red file in this file system just stands for your zip file. Uh, I could do file just to confirm that, yes, it's a zip file. And if I look in projects, dev sponsor zero, zero, you see, uh, I've copied the archive and I've made it available to all of you. So later, if I, for some reason you couldn't curl the file or uh, you can copy the file, but you have access to the system, you can use that file. It is shared by all of you. Everyone has read access to this file. Uh, I think you just couldn't remove it though. Uh, if we do ls minus l, no, not this, this, all right. Uh, we can look at the permission on the file. And as you can see, uh, so these permissions are for me. So R is for read, uh, W is for write, and X is for execute. So this is for me as an owner of the file, I have the right to read, write, and execute the file. On the other hand, those three, uh, those three letters are for groups. And since we are all part of the same sponsor group, so sponsor double zero, uh, we all also share the same permissions and you all have the right to read and execute that file, but not write it. So if you were to try to actually remove, enter the commands to remove, uh, remove def sponsor, zero, zero. Me personally, I can enter that command, but you cannot. Uh, if you try it, it should be, it should enter, uh, it should return an error saying permission denied. Uh, so that's it for copying file 
uh, from your computer or from the internet. Uh, if, and as I said, if I wanted to uh, download the file from the internet, I would have, uh, I would have went for curl uh, dash uppercase L dash minor case O, then I'm in the file. And so I download from the internet and I also have permission that's it. I'm going to go back to my slides. Present. Git is installed on the um, on the uh, supercomputer. You, you can just uh, git clone um, a git repository as uh, Elizabeth demonstrated. And that repository will be just a, a copy uh, of your code on the on the uh, supercomputer. Uh, you can, you know, do uh, uh, possibly do some uh, uh, some change in that code, and you and possibly push those changes directly to your uh, to your home computer. That's th those things I don't recommend. I'm just uh, demonstrating that Git uh, is actually able to. Uh, talk from one repository to another as soon as you have internet and some uh, protocol to uh, identify yourself uh, uh, you can actually push approve things uh, from uh, from different places uh, so uh, yeah obviously yeah, it'd be easier for you to uh, use a central place like github uh, so like you push, push the code to github synchronize things and then uh, pull from uh, from GitHub, but uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to demonstrate that uh, this uh, this works uh, uh, with another place than uh, GitHub or your home computer. So so far we have uh, we have became aware that we might need a supercomputer or we might need Compute Canada infrastructure in general. Uh, we know now how we can create an account, and we have duly noted that those resources are free and you can get access to expertise and hardware for free thanks to your institution and our governments. Uh, we have seen how we can actually connect to the system through what we call a secure shell or SSH. And uh, we have, tr we have uh, started to put on some files on, in our home in order to customize or start our work. Uh, we have uh, we have said that those files can come from your personal computer. That can be done through SCP or some other tools. Uh, there are uh, graphical tools that that could be used. For example, WinSCP if you're on Windows. Uh, FileZilla. There there are tons of uh, UI tools that can be used. Uh, but SCP will always be there. Uh, and we also have been. Uh, trying to copy files from our computer to the cluster. And we have seen that you cannot copy, uh, you, in order to copy that file, you have to be, you have to call SCP from your computer and not from the supercomputer. Now, a, all of these files, all of, those, of this work wouldn't uh, be useful if it were not for access to software. So, uh, that might be surprising, but most of the software that you will need are already installed on the cluster. And the reason is uh, tons of researchers have came through our system before you. Uh, we're talking, uh, we, I think we have a few thousands of users uh, each year, active users, on Compute Canada cluster, and each of these users have uh, new software needs. So most probably, unless you have developed your own software, most probably, and if it is open source, maybe someone already has for it, uh, but most likely it is already available. Now, you might ask like, but how can you, how can you have all of these softwares without it being a total chaos, right? Uh, you might already have tried on your own computer to install just two different versions of the same software and couldn't do it, uh, or it, it has to mess with files or and stuff. So we all went through it. 
And uh, this is a common issue with uh, high performance computing clusters around the world. So someone actually had to came up with a bright idea. And that's the idea is module. So uh, you, when you actually want a soft, to use a software on a Compute Canada cluster, you will need to enter a command that will load a module and make the software visible to your current uh, computing environments. So modules allow uh, to actually install different version of the same software uh, without any conflicts or uh, without uh, messing up with the files from the other version. So we can have, so we currently have like seven different version of the GCC compiler. Uh, we have probably six or five, five or six version of MATLAB, uh, ANSYS. We have every time there's a new version of a software that we already have installed, uh, most likely a user is going to ask for it. So we have like probably six version of R, et cetera. So we can have all of those versions of the same software install without conflicts because of modules. So you can uh, see uh, modules as a form of a switchboard. So when you want to access the software, you just flip the switch on the software version that uh, you would like to use, and it's going to appear magically just as flipping a switch, a light switch on your, in your living room. Uh, so module is a command itself, uh, and it's not typically available on, uh, in a shell or on the shell in your, your computer. Uh, that said, you could install module if you'd like. Uh, Compute Canada is actually using a special version of module called LMOD, uh, which is developed by University of Texas, or the TAC, uh, Texas Advanced Computing uh, Center, TAC. Uh, so in order to interact with module, you will need to use the module command. So to find a module, you will need to launch the spider Crawl, have the spider crawl on the web of modules. So if you're looking, for example, for GCC, you would enter module spider, the command spider. So spider is being a sub command of the module command, followed by the module name. So don't put the uh, greater, greater than, smaller than sign. This is just a placeholder. Uh, so if you were lo looking for uh, Open refine, for example, you will do module spider open refine. Uh, this will output you something. We'll see it uh, in the terminal afterward. It's going to tell you which module you need to load first in order to access that software. Module avail are the flip switch available to you right now. So you don't have to load any more modules. Those softwares are available to you directly. Module list is, will uh, show you on screen the softwares that are currently loaded for your environment. So those are the software that you can access directly. Module load followed by the name of the module is the command to load a module or make a new software available in your environment. And module onload is going to remove the module from your list. Going to demonstrate that in the terminal. All right. Uh, this is the. Uh, this was the command to unban some of the IPs. Uh, long slack. Copy. All right. So I'm user 80, I'm in my home, I'm on brain.calculcomic.com, and I would like to use some software. So first I can ask myself, well, what kind of software do I have loaded right now? So I can do module list. So module list is going to return you some of the base module uh, available. If you don't know what these modules are, uh, I recommend you to just leave them be. Uh, 
these are generally like basic modules that are going to be needed to compile your software, compile a new software. Uh, IMKL is, for example, a uh, liner algebra uh, library provided by Intel. GCC is a compiler and OpenMPI is a network uh, communication protocol to do fast uh, interconnect uh, nego uh, communication between the different drums. Now I would like to, I don't know, I would like to use uh, R. So I can do module avail. Module avail is going to show me all of the modules that are currently available on, uh, and that I can load directly. And I was not kidding. When I said there are 10, there are thousands of software, and this is just for, this is just for, for the current environment. So just with the module list here, this provide me access to all of these modules, all of these software. So I could, I see I have Julia here. So I could do, I would like to do some Julia. So I'm going to do module load Julia. If I only enter Julia without the version number, I can do that. It's going to load the default, the default module. And the default module is identified by the D letter next to it. So when I just enter module load Julia, I actually loaded uh, Julia 1.4.1. And there is no limit to the amount of module that you can load at the same time, as long as they are not in conflict. So if we have two software doing the same thing, you can only have one module of the same time at the same time, uh, loaded at the same time. So for example, you cannot have the Intel compiler loaded at the same time as GCC, but you can have Julia loaded at the same time as you have, for example, Python 3.8. And you can have like whatever you like. You can load all the modules. And if the software that you're looking for is not directly available in Avail, you can always launch a spider crawling in the web of modules and looking for whatever uh, software that you want to use, want to use. So for example, I would like to use also OpenRefine. I'm going to enter module spider OpenRefine. And it's going to tell me, so you will need, it's going to tell me the, the modules that I need to load in order to access that software. So you will need to load ah, la, la, those modules made available. And it's just Nix uh, packages 16.09. And if I look at module list, I already have that module loaded. So I could do module load open refine. And again, I have not specified a version because I don't care. Uh, but I could have specified 3.3. And if it is not specified, it's going to default on the default version. Uh, if you want to use, uh, if you don't want to use module or you are not uh, connected to a system and you would like to uh, you would like to know what are the available software and you're not comfortable, for example, with module spider. And before actually sending us an email asking us to install a software, you can go on dots, docs.computecanada. Oops, I'm not sharing the right thing. Sorry. Uh, if, uh, so you can, if I go on docs.computecanada.ca and I'm sharing that right. All right. Uh, in the system and services section, you will see there is an available software link. If you click on that. And it waits some time. All right. Uh, it's, first, it's going to tell you some uh, things about specificity of the Computer Canada cluster. But then you will find all of the name of the modules and without having uh, to send a spider crawling in his web of modules, uh, you will be able to find your software uh, 
through and if you don't want to go through the old page you can always do control f and sys for example and if you unwrap the uh, the cell it has a small and fancy description and that actual table is uh, generated dynamically uh, so each time we install a new software the uh, wiki page is updated uh, I, I think you, uh, you, this morning you have been shown about BID's uh, Python package. Now you might ask, what about Python package? Uh, is, it, is it a software? Is it a module? Python packages are a bit special. Uh, since there are too many, uh, since there are as many <laughs> Python packages, if not more, uh, or R packages or Julia packages, then we can think in terms of uh, softwares, uh, we don't want to create modules specifically for each Python packages. So what we do is we encourage users and we do that on our wiki. And if I do go on the Python section, we encourage our users to use uh, virtual environments. And the following question could be, what about Conda? Uh, can I use Conda environments on your uh, supercomputer? Please don't. Uh, most, uh, so when, we, when you want to use uh, Python packages on our supercomputer, please install them in virtual environment and we describe how to create virtual environment on Compute Canada cluster. Uh, if your current package is not made of it. And the reason why we go through virtual environments is that when you actually install Python packages through virtual environment and pip, uh, the source of those packages is most likely our own, uh, what we call a wheelhouse. So Compute Canada has its own repo for Python packages. And those Python packages are going to be installed in your virtual environment. Why not Conda? There's an issue with Conda creating tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands of files in your home. Uh, Conda is very convenient to use on your own personal computer because it is providing all of the requirements, including the compilers, MPI, everything that is already provided as a module on a Compute Canada cluster. Uh, if you actually install Conda in your own folder, you are downloading a small part of the internet. I'm not kidding. Uh, we are talking tens of thousands of files in your own folder. And that wouldn't be so bad, right? Files are free. Uh, but when you actually use a Compute Canada cluster, there is a limit to the number of files that you can have in your own or in your project. And just by installing Conda, you can reach that limit. And that limit is high. We're talking 500,000 files in your own folder. And just by installing Conda, you can reach that limit. We've seen it more often than not. Don't use Conda. We have a section on the wiki explaining why you shouldn't use Conda on our supercomputer and if you if you really really want to use conda uh in the end we might want to uh, we we probably are going to advise you to use a docker file or a singularity uh file a container in which you're going to install conda and for the file system it's going to be seen as a single file uh, but you're going to have your hundreds or millions of files installed by conda inside a container and that probably won't be really performant but at least you won't face the file limit uh, issue now so sorry for uh that smile uh small uh aparte uh regarding conda um, as i was saying um I think it is, this is just a quick remark. This is great, uh, Felix Anton, because the, you know, students have seen virtual they have seen uh, Conda, they have seen uh, Docker, 
a bit. So like you, you this is a very nice uh, connection to uh, the previous uh, uh, talks and. Uh, and All right. Structures. Good. Uh, and if you want to, uh, so I haven't covered. Uh, we won't be able to cover singularity, but if you want to, uh, the virtual cluster is going to be available after this workshop and for the time being of BrainHack. Uh, if you want to try Singularity with your Docker file, uh, you can go look on Compute Canada Wiki. And Singularity is also installed in Virtual Cluster. Uh, we can do module load Singularity normally. And Singularity is available, installed, and normally functional. If it doesn't work, uh, you can tell me. I can look at what's wrong. Uh, it's not commonly used on the virtual cluster, but if you like to try it with the Docker files that you have seen uh, earlier uh, during this week, you, you, can, you can look at Compute Canada documentation. And if you want to run Docker on uh, Compute Canada cluster, you will have to go through a singularity. Uh, Daniel is asking, what's the disadvantage of using Conda with a, within a singularity container? Uh, there's there's no disadvantage, but it's probably won't be uh, will be less performant than using the equivalent Python packages that we have compiled and made available uh, directly uh, on our system. So it's it won't be a major uh, uh, loss of performance, uh, but you might get uh, you might get less performance by using Singularity and Conda than using just the equivalent Python package in a virtual environment compiled by our uh, expert staff on Compute Canada Plus. Uh, what's the max storage a regular user has on CC? You have all, uh, I don't know on top of my head, but you have all this information on the Compute Canada Wiki and if my, uh, I'm going to try to get it out of my head. I think it's 10 terabytes of projects uh, for a lab. And uh, I don't know for the rest, but you can look, you can look at the wiki and there might be some discre discrepancies between the clusters. Uh, so you will be able to get like 10 terabytes per cluster. So if you are willing to use more than one cluster, you can expand your storage. And this is uh, the default uh, value. Uh, max storage, uh, this is a question for the resource allocation competition. So if you want to access more data, uh, have access to more storage, uh, apply to the competition and ask for the max is actually the number of petabytes that we have available on on one system. Uh, you probably won't be able to access to 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 request access to a petabyte of data. Uh, but I don't know if your science score on the competition is very high and you have a use for it. Maybe maybe you can. All right. So we have seen how to load our software. And we are currently connected to what we call a login node. Uh, now, can we, uh, can we execute our software directly on the login node? Am I, am I, am I authorized to run software directly there? It's, I'm, a, I'm, on, I'm on a supercomputer, right? I'm, I should have access to all the power. Uh, I can run commands. I can load software. I, can, I, can I run my software now? No, don't, don't, don't run software there. The computer that you are connecting to using SSH is a login node, and that login node is shared by all users of the supercomputer. Except that's, put, don't quote me on that. Uh, there are three or four login nodes, and there's a small load balance between users, but most all of users actually eventually share a common computer and that computer is called the login node and that node you shouldn't run your actual research software directly on it it is fine to use it to copy file it is fine to run a small script that will download files from the internet but if your script takes more than a few minutes or more than a few hundred of megabytes of memory, it's too much. 
you are actually sharing compu your, this computer with all other users. And since it has a finite amount of resources, you cannot run your software directly on that computer. But how? How can I ask to get resources on the supercomputer? You're, you're asking, well, this is what we're going to cover next. So in order to run your software, you're going to package it or you're going to write a script uh, which we will refer to as a job or multiple jobs. So what is a jobs? A jobs is a batch script. So it's when you are using a supercomputer, most of the time you won't use it interactively. So you will describe in a script the series of command that need to be, uh, that need to be run in order to produce your results. You're going to write this in a file and you're going to submit that file to the scheduler. So it's like sending a fax to your circuitry saying you should like do this, this and that and fax me back the result eventually. So the scheduler is like your own personal secretary that manages a whole bunch of workers that you won't interact with directly. Okay. So, uh, how do we, how do we interact with a schedule? So jobs are, uh, as I was saying, jobs are deferred to the job scheduler based on the availability of resources. So why do we use the scheduler? It's because the resources are busy. Uh, they are sharing, but, uh, there are more there are more jobs to run than the actual uh, physical resources available so we have to schedule them we have to make them available based on the parameters of your job but also your priority so if you have won the competition we want to make sure that your job will run in a decent amount of time so your primary, your priority will be higher than someone who is actually using its default allocation So your job have to be autonomous or be run in a batch mode. Uh, and you might find that terminology in your uh, favorite software. So some software have an interactive mode and a batch mode. Most of the time you will want to use the batch mode of your, of your software. Uh, so how those, uh, so once your, your, your script is written, the parameters are, uh, are, are part of your script when you submit your job. The, uh, the priority when your job is going to be run uh, is, depends on its priority. And that priority is based on the score or the amount of resources that you have available based on your allocation. So if you are using a default allocation, everyone has the same priority but that priority then decreases based on your usage. So if you've been using a thousand core in the last day, probably the day, the next day, your priority will be on the floor and you won't be able to get access for resources for a week or so until your priority actually grows back. So, uh, and the idea is to actually make sure that everyone who's using the supercomputer get a fair share of that supercomputer based on their last usage and a target of uh, resources that they should be able to reach. And again, if you have a default allocation, everyone has the same target. But if you want the allocation competition, you are entitled to a higher priority, a higher target that the scheduler will try to reach uh, but it's not a hard limit. So even if you have a default allocation, if there is no one on the supercomputer because it's Christmas uh, and everyone forgot to actually launch job, you can actually launch jobs and jobs after jobs of tens and thousands of cores because the first uh, target for Compute Canada staff is to make sure that our resources are used and then that they are used well. So if 
your job, if you are only the only one in the waiting queue, uh, your job is going to is going to run just fine. Uh, the wait time comes in when there are multiple people in the wait queue and uh, their priority uh, is different. So the resources that you can ask for when you redact the job, when you define a script, are the amount of cores, the amount of nodes, if you need more than a single computer, the amount of GPUs, uh, the time. So the time is a parameter. Uh, so based on the supercomputer that you are going to use, uh, those parameters are going to be different, including the time. So on Cedar, for example, you can have jobs that are up to a one month of runtime. On some other system, we try to uh, limit those startup jobs if not to do not allow them at all. Uh, because if your job runs for a whole month, uh, they are very likely will crash at some point before finishing and losing all of your uh, precious results. So instead of pushing towards very, very long job, what we try to do is get staff to help you do what we call milestoning or saving your results uh, after 48 hours and submit multiple jobs that will build on to a full month. Uh, memory is another, uh, is also a schedule and licenses. So if uh, you need uh, special licenses of a commercial software and you have a finite amount of, of those licenses, it can be programmed in the schedule. Uh, as I was saying, so every, every cluster has resource limits and those limits will tend to be different uh, from one cluster to another. So you need to refer to the wiki to know about, about those limits. Uh, if, you, if you're lazy and you don't actually refer to the wiki, you can actually just eyeball uh, the limits and when you submit your job, uh, there's a possibility that the scheduler says, no, uh, this, what you're asking for exceed the limit available uh, on the system. Or uh, if you're too lazy and uh, the scheduler is lazy too, there's a possibility that your job will be submitted, but uh, it won't ever run. So uh, just, Go have a quick read at the wiki, look for the limits, and uh, you should be fine. There are uh, different kind of job types. So uh, sequential jobs are, you have a single process, a single uh, core program that you want to run, and you have like multiple hundreds of those to actually, uh, to actually run. If your program is only using a single core, there is no benefit in actually asking for 30. Uh, it, it, won't, it won't run faster. Uh, it's just, it's no good. Uh, so since a uh, general purpose cluster, you can ask for a single core, you should always ask for the exact amount of resources that you need and not more. Uh, because you won't necessarily benefit from more cores. And even if your actual software benefits from using multiple cores, uh, there's a possibility that there's a limit to the number of cores on which your software can scale. So for example, there are software that can scale up to four cores, but even if you provide eight, you might see a potential decrease of performance. So it's always a good idea if you are doing sequential jobs or you're starting to work on with more than one core uh, to look at the manual of your software and make sure that you can benefit from adding resources. And even, uh, and on top of that, it's okay for cores uh, to maybe ask for more than one cores. The software are more and more aware of and uh, using uh, more and more cores, but asking for more nodes, that's a problem. Uh, most of the software do not have the uh, requirement, uh, the, the requirement networking programming embedded in them to allow distribution on more than one computer. So 
Uh, if you ask for two nodes, but your software is only using one node, you will get a you you will certainly get an email from a friendly uh, staff member telling you, well, you are using you are asking for two nodes, but you're only using one. Please review your job and uh, remove that extra node that you you are using. So always make sure that the program uh, you're using can actually benefit from the resources that you're asking. I've seen uh, not not later than I think two months ago, I saw a user uh, asking for four GPUs uh, to do uh, SciPy uh, sci jobs. So he was doing, uh, or scikit-learn jobs, except scikit-learn actually doesn't have any GPU programming. Uh, so it's not because you're doing matrices uh, or linear algebra stuff that your software necessarily benefits from GPU. So always make sure that the, G, the, the software that you are using actually benefits from the resources that you're asking and that you're actually providing the right parameters for your software to benefit from these resources. And parallel jobs are more, uh, are more exceptional. So you will use multiple nodes at once and you will require, as I said, this requires some uh, networking uh, aspect on the on the programming software in Python, for example, you would have to use Dask or uh, PySpark or something, some framework of that level that can actually benefit from more the more than one node. If you are just starting using supercomputer, try to limit yourself to a single node. See if it uh, see if it actually see your program is actually benefiting from these resources and always refer to your software manual or your friendly software developer to make sure that you can benefit from more resources from GPU and from more nodes. Uh, so when we talk about data parallelism, it's just we are looking for running the same job, running the same task on multiple data. And then there's different, uh, uh, there's different approaches that we can take uh, so, for example, if you if you'd like to do analysis on hundred images, if a single if uh, analyzing a single image take multiple hours, you might want to define a single job to run on a single image and submit more and submit hundred jobs to the scheduler. But uh, if uh, the analysis of an image takes only a few minutes, you will want to package the analysis of the images inside a single job. So uh, just a Tom's rule, when you are designing job, you will want to have at least an hour of work uh, submitted. Otherwise, you are losing the, the amount of time that you will have in the waiting queue might be uh, longer than the actual uh, job runtime, and it's not beneficial to anyone. Not beneficial on the cluster scheduling point of view, and it's not beneficial for you because you have wasted more time in the waiting queue than actually running running a job. So a sweet spot for jobs that run uh, that do not wait uh, very long in the waiting queue. It's under three hours. Uh, you have access to all the actual nodes available in the in the cluster uh, and over uh, over three hours so there are ranges of uh, of wall time that you will uh, that get access to a uh, smaller and smaller part of the cluster so when you actually submit a one month uh, wall time job you only get a, there's only if small part of the cluster that can run those those longer jobs so it means you will have to run even longer on the on a waiting queue so all that's it all that's it all that you say just try to find a the, the right sweet spot of all time uh, when designing your job uh, based on the amount of work that you want to do don't make it too small don't make it too long uh, three hours to 48 hours is generally a good, a good runtime, if it is possible. Uh, 
in order to design a job, what you are going to write, as I said, is, is, is a script or a submit file. So when we refer to a job or the, the script, we generally use the term submit file because you're going to submit that file to the scheduler uh, in order to run your job. So the scheduler we are using when uh, we are using at Compute Canada is called Slurm. So Slurm is just managing the uh, resources available and all the scripts and all the jobs of all users. And it's playing with the switches and making sure uh, it, it runs uh, on, the, on, the, on the system. So Slurm is our workload manager. It's an open source uh, software. Uh, so this is why we can also use it on the uh, virtual cross. So a submit file is composed of two parts. So there's a header, uh, which is composed of co bash comments. And this section is only meant for the scheduler. So it won't be executed by your program. It's just meant for the scheduler. It will define what, how many cores you need, what's the wall time, how many memory, et cetera. Uh, if you would like, and then after the header, it's the actual code that you want to execute. So the call to the different uh, software in order to produce the results. So the submit file editor looks like this. So it always starts with uh, the uh, pound and exclamation mark, which is called in a shell script, it's a shebang. Uh, and followed by the actual shell that will run the script underneath. So most of the submit file are written in bash and it's a good thing you've learned about bash in the, in the, in the last few days. Uh, but you could write, uh, you could actually write your submit file in Perl if you'd like or some other, uh, some other shell in Python. I don't recommend it. Uh, if you want help uh, at some point, it's better to have written all of your software, uh, all of your submit file in bash and have the actual software, for example, in Python, uh, your script in Python uh, executed later by Python, not by the scheduler. So the interpreter, always the first line, it should always be there. Uh, always make sure it's, it's there in your, in, your, uh, in your submit script. Then the following line are uh, always starting with pound as batch. Make sure the S batch is always all uppercase and it's not pound slurm, it's always pound S batch all uppercase. So if the and the pound in bash is a comment, so everything after the pound is actually ignored by the shell. Uh, but Slurm will be looking for the keyword S batch all uppercase. And if it is missing, if you are, uh, if it is in lowercase, uh, Slurm is going to miss it. So always make sure it's S batch uppercase. Then uh, we provide the different flags defining the, uh, the parameters of our job. So in this case, we want to run a, a three hour jobs and this is the upper limit. So it's not, uh, it's okay if the job only runs for one hour, but if the, the job uh, needed four hours and we only gave it three, after three hours, the job is going to get killed and you're going to lose your result. So always make sure to ask for more, for, for enough wall time or to uh, make sure to save your results as you are producing them. Uh, then, the amount of nodes. So as I was saying uh, earlier, if normally if you're just starting using a supercomputer, you will want just one node. The number of tasks and the number of CPUs. Uh, so if you only want to run a single program, uh, the number of tasks is going to be one. And then if you can use more than one core, you're going to up the uh, number of CPUs here to the number of cores that you would like to use. So in uh, Slurm terminologies, 
CPUs and cores are equivalent. And uh, you, this is where you will define uh, the, um, the number of cores that you want to use. And then you can use uh, dash dash mem per CPU. So if you want to define the number, of, the, the quantity of memory that you need uh, for per CPU, you can define it here. So this is this would provide you one gigabytes of memory per course. Uh, but you could, if you have no idea per course, but you know the global amount of memory that you want, you can go with s batch dash dash memory equal the amount of memory that you need. And that amount of memory will be for a single node. So if you need more than, if you need more than one node, it's going to specify the number of memory, uh, the quantity of memory per node. Uh, then when you actually schedule a job, when you submit a job, you submit a job with an account. So uh, if it is your first time on a Compute Canada cluster, you probably are going to have a single account and uh, you probably won't need to specify it. But once your PI actually has won a resource allocation competition, you will get more than one account and you will want to use the, uh, the account given to you by uh, following the resource allocation competition because the account is what we are using to make sure that your priority is right and you're getting the resources that you are entitled to. So if you don't have a, you don't have a special account, it's going to be def followed normally by the username of your PI and uh, if you need, uh, if your PI is actually one, for example, 300 cores for the coming year, it's going to be called, for example, RRG, followed by the name of your PI. And if you want to make sure that you can access to those 300 cores in a reasonable amount of time, you will want to use uh, the second identifier and not the default one. Finally, they are all, uh, this is just a, an example of the options that you can use uh, in, in SBatch. Uh, but if you'd like, for example, to request a GPU, there are tons of other options uh, that are all described on our wiki. Uh, so the submit file body typically starts, so, after the S batch, we're going just to write our commands and our command shouldn't start with a pound unless it's a command. If we start our command line with a pound, it's going to be ignored by the shell. So our job is not going to do anything. So after this, what we should find in your submit file are only lines that are not starting with a pound. Uh, all of these lines need to be consecutive. So you cannot write this, uh, these as batch uh, section at the end of the file. They should always start a file and the instant you enter a line between uh, those as batch values, the rest of the as batch is going to, are going to be ignored. So just make sure that this section is always at the very beginning of your file. So afterward, uh, after those uh, instructions to the scheduler, normally you will find, for example, some uh, uh, some module that are needed. So the software that you would like to use in your in your environment, uh, you will need to load the modules. So typically, your uh, your submit file will start with module load something. In order to submit your submit script you will have to use commands that are uh, provided by Slurm. So to submit your submit script, you will use the command as batch, followed by the name of your script. Again, the greater and smaller than, uh, they shouldn't be there. It's just to uh, make emphasis on the actual, uh, the, the placeholder, which is script. So this, uh, so you're going to do as batch followed by the path and the file name to your submit script. And it's going to return you a job ID. So just as you're going to your, in your favorite butcher shop or uh, 
I don't know, something that gives you a ticket uh, with a number on it. When you're going to the doctor, you ask for when, when I can see the doctor next and they give you a number. That's the same, that's the same principle. You're going to be provided a number that you can follow using the SQ uh, command. And you're going to be able to see where you are standing in the waiting queue but you won't be able to see when you're uh, just as when you are uh, visiting an emergency room in Quebec, uh, you won't know when your job is running because there's always a chance that someone submitted jobs and that job has a higher priority than you and they skip you in the line. So we are not able to actually provide you a sensible uh, or a a coherent uh, estimation of when your job is going to run. So always make sure to ask for the amount of resources that you need. And that will guarantee that you won't, uh, you won't wait more than you have to. Uh, so with SQ, you can actually see what's the, what's the waiting queue. And once your job is running, it's going to appear also in the SQ output. And if you don't want to see all jobs that are currently in a waiting queue on the cluster, because we can, uh, this might output hundreds and thousands of lines, uh, you can specify the dash U uh, followed by your username or the environment variable uh, dollar user uh, that contain your username to just uh, display the, uh, the jobs that are associated with your username. If you have committed a mistake, uh, you have asked for a wall time that is greater than what you intended and you already have submitted your job, you can always cancel the job. Uh, if, or if the job is already running or in, in is, you look at the log and it is uh, spitting some insanity in your log and it's, it's not what you meant, you can always cancel the job. So just as cancel followed by the job ID again the greater and smaller than uh, shouldn't be in the command. Uh, as cancel won't return anything unless there's an error. So if you call as cancel in a job ID and nothing is displayed, everything is fine. Job just got canceled and eventually it will be removed from the waiting queue. Uh, you can also consult uh, the amount of resources that were consumed by your, uh, by your job. By, uh, once it is finished, you can call S act, uh, followed by uh, minus J and the job ID. And it's going to tell you how many, uh, what, what quantity of memory that you have used and what's the percentage of usage of the cores that were available that were correctly used. So when you're starting to get accustomed to, uh, to cluster and you're starting to submit your first test jobs, uh, you might want to refer to S act to make sure that you, uh, you are correctly using the resources that you ask for and to make, uh, to, to adjust uh, if needed the amount of memory. So if, for example, you're saying, well, Felix, I have no idea like how many, how many mem how, how much memory do I need for this job? Uh, we're going to use a rule of thumb uh, based on the number of cores that you, you would like to use. And then we are going to adjust that number based, uh, we are going to decrease that number based on the value of the, the output of S act if the job completed correctly. And we are going to increase it if by looking the log, we find out that, for example, your job uh, did not have a, enough memory and was killed because it was missing, uh, it was missing some memory. The exercise are defined here. So if we look at uh, the terminal, so the zip file that we, uh, that we downloaded uh, earlier, uh, we can actually extract this content by calling the unzip command. So I say unzip CQ formation premier slum cloud, that's it. 
what it's going to do is extract a folder in my own folder or in my current working directory. Uh, if, uh, if I have not downloaded a file and I would like to use the zip file in the uh, project folder, I could have done unzip projects def sponsor zero zero zero. Uh, I deleted it. Oh, crap. What I wanted to do is unzip projects def sponsor zero zero. There. You go. So I could have just written the uh, whole path to the uh, the zip file and extract it and extract the content of the folder locally. And if I go in the folder, there is a readme uh, .en if you are uh, English native or .fr if you prefer to read in French. And it's uh, instructing you, so you don't need to uh, get the workshop exercise material, you already have it. And it's uh, telling you how to uh, different example of uh, jobs that you might want to run. But the first step is actually to compile a program that is called uh, um, filterimage.exe. So read the readme and then you can uh, go through the different exercises in each folder. So uh, there's five exercises and the, uh, based on the, uh, the, the folder, uh, folder numbers. Uh, you can do this at your own pace, uh, and if you have any questions, you can always uh, you can always ping me on Slack or ping the TAs on Slack. Uh, so, because I want to make sure that I can cover the rest of uh, the thing, and it's going to instruct you for example to do how if i do go on one base there's a submit.sh dot so what you will want to do is modify that submit.sh with your favorite uh editor either vim or nano i don't think emacs is uh emacs is there and I don't know how to quit Emacs. Crap. All right, Control Z, uh, let, me, <laughs> let me quit Emacs. All right, so choose your favorite uh, text editor and you can, uh, what's, what the, the goal of each exercise is just to come up with a submit file with the right parameters. So in my case, I would prefer uh, Vim and uh, I would enter the different parameters. And then once I'm ready to submit, I can call sbatch submits.sh, enter command, enter uh, and press enter, and it's going to uh, submit that command. I can always look at the execution queue. And since I was the only one in the execution queue, my, uh, my submit script was uh, went through just fine. And I can look at the output at slum to output. So you can already go in one base and submit, submit SH if you like. Uh, and there's some more instruction on in the readme on what you should do in the uh, submit SH. Um, share. Okay. All right. So we have seen how we can execute a task or a job or sub again those are ex exchangeable uh ex ex exchangeable uh, terms what will probably happen um and it 
happens to me still, uh, even after I've been working at Calico Quebec since 2010. I'm facing issue. Uh, I'm writing bad submit script. Uh, I, I don't know. I've drank um, uh, enough coffee in the morning. Uh, I, I, it happens. Okay. Uh, issue happens and you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be uh, ashamed of those issues. Uh, you should know that even like, most of our sysadmins, most of our staff at some point face issues when just submitting even basic jobs on a supercomputers because those are complex system. Uh, and the reason why I put this in the typical user experience, it's, it's not the typical new user experience. It's typical for users to experiment issues and you should be aware of what are those typical issues? And also, what, what can you do when facing those issues? Typical mistakes and tips. So I've stressed it a bit uh, along this, uh, this workshop, but only ask for the resources that you need and not more. And if you're not, uh, if you're not sure of the amount of resources that you, that you want, uh, that you need, uh, if you're not sure that your software can actually benefit from those resources, just send us an email uh, or go knock on uh, or send an email to someone you know actually uses the software. Uh, but Compute Canada staff don't bite. Uh, they're pretty gentle. Uh, so if there's... There is no harm in asking questions before running, uh, running your software, just to make sure. On the other hand, if you uh, start contacting us, make sure to have actually read the documentation of your software and have at least being a bit aware of the stuff that we have put on the wiki. Uh, if we find out that you haven't read anything that we have put up on the wiki before asking us questions. And the answer is expressively entered and written on the wiki. We will answer you, but you might find our tone to be a bit rough. Uh, we might just send you a link to the wiki. Uh, we have spent considerable hours just reading this wiki and I'm aware uh, this is not perfect documentation is always uh it's it's a it's a constant battle uh we're trying to document as much as possible and be as clear as possible but and if you find an issue even with the wiki uh please tell us but if you haven't read the wiki if you haven't do if you haven't done at least a bit of your homework before and just by being there today a bit of your homework is actually done so you are almost already ready to contact us uh, regarding facing issues and, and stuff. All right. Uh, as I was saying, you will not, you will not, your your code will not run significantly significantly faster just by asking for four GPUs if your code is not ready to run on four GPUs. Uh, there's unfortunately nothing magical about supercomputers. It's just pretty basic and code uh, to rarely uh, find out by themselves about tons of resources and just magically uh, take, to take good use of the resources available. So again, if you're not, not sure, uh, your software can actually benefit from, uh, from more resources or from GPUs, just, just send us an email. Uh, we'll gently answer you from the best of our knowledge or refer you to your, uh, your software developers if we have no idea whatsoever. Uh, but there's less arm in asking first. Uh, otherwise, if you are asking for more resources than you actually need and you are underusing those resources, uh, you might get a small slap on the hand by a staff through email saying you, well, you know, you're not using correctly the resources available to you. Uh, please 
review your parameters. Uh, there's a common mistakes that is not there, uh, but I've covered it, but it, it's important to stress it. Don't run code on the login node. Once you SSH and you get a terminal, you're not ready to run your software. Always, always put your commands to put, to, to produce scientific results in a submit script that you're going to submit to Slurm. Otherwise, and that happens, and that happens even with like users that have been using our software for years. You will start, you will be tempted to run your software directly on the login node. We will find you and we will ban your account for the amount of time required for you to understand that your code should not run on the login node. And it's generally longer than an hour. So if you don't want us to put you in the corner with the bad user hat, just don't run code on the login. It's pretty easy. Just don't. Uh, and some, some users, when I say that, some users got, get scared. I don't want a bad user hat. No, no. So can I, can I compile program? Yes, you can call by program. It, it's fine. But if your program is running for multiple minutes and using a considerable amount of RAM, you, uh, you might have an issue. Don't run it on the, on the login. Mode. Sorry for making the small voice. It's the typical user voice. No, none of our users actually have that voice. Uh, look out for file format. Uh, a word document is not a, a text file. It's a word document. Uh, when you contact us, uh, if you have like outputs or logs or stuff, please don't put them in the Word documents. Uh, you can just paste them in the, in the, uh, in the email. Uh, if you had issues, like if you had output in your terminal, uh, please don't take a pictures with your cell phone of your terminal. Uh, please don't take screenshot of your terminal. Please just know that your terminal is actually text. So if, if you'd like to share some error or some output of your terminal with your, uh, with your gentle staff, uh, just share text with us. Uh, images, uh, we will answer you. Uh, but again, might be a bit of a snarky tone if you actually share pictures of your monitor took with your cell phone of the output of an actual text file or a turn. Uh, so that's a common mistake that's not there too. But again, uh, it, if, you are, uh, if you are transferring file from your Windows computer into, uh, into a supercomputer and that's a text file, uh, you might have to use DOS to Unix. So Windows and Linux or Windows and Unix use uh, different uh, end of line characters. And if uh, Slurm actually finds weird characters that would put uh, to uh, signify, uh, to meant end of line uh, in Windows in a text file, uh, it, it, might, it might have issues. So uh, if you're transferring text file from Windows uh, and you're not use, if you are using, for example, Notepad instead of Notepad++ or VS Code, uh, you, might, you might have issues. So you can look, uh, if you look at the wiki on, uh, if you look for the command DOS to Unix on the wiki, there's more explanation on what you should do. And again, never launch resource hungry processes on the login nodes. Uh, now, finally, so you have uh, submitted your job, you have produced your very nice results, and now you are ready to get back those results you can get back the results uh, using SCP again, but by uh, switching the, the source and the target when, uh, from our first command, but by always 
calling SCP from your own computer. So the target, uh, the copy target can be on a distant computer if you actually tell them the path and the, uh, the server name and uh, your username, followed by a dot to instruct where or the path to the, the, the folder what you will, where you would want to actually install, uh, copy the file. Uh, as I was saying, when we first talk about SCP, if you try to call SCP on the supercomputer to your own computer, your own computer does not have visibility from the internet uh, uh, on the supercomputer. So you won't be able to, or very difficult, uh, it will be very hard to actually copy a file from the supercomputer to a uh, to your uh, to your own uh, your own computer, but you could uh, on the supercomputer you could copy a file using the same command that we've seen a, a pre previous slide before uh, to another supercomputer. That 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 is fine because other supercomputers are visible from the internet, but your own computer is most likely not visible from the internet, and it, that's fine. Uh, you don't want bad actors looking at your, or at your computers from the internet. And if you expose your computer to the internet, you have a very highly likely percentage uh, chances of having bad actors poking at your computer and you don't want that. Uh, if uh, the, uh, the amount of data that you would like to transfer is, is large, uh, you have large results, there is a uh there's a there's a tool called globus and you are all you already have access to that tool once you get your compute canada account so globus can be used to transfer file uh using a graphical tool uh in a web browser between uh compute canada cluster but also you can have a globus client installed on your personal computer and see your globus client in the web ui uh, if you look at the slides at the end, there's a, uh, there's a few slides explaining to you how you can set up your own, what they call global endpoint to transfer file to and from your, uh, your own personal computer with Globus and, uh, friendly user interface with on one side, your, the supercomputer on the other side, your personal computer, and you just, you switch, uh, you, you transfer file. Uh, the advantage of Globus is that even if you're, uh, you leave the office and the transfer is not finished and you reopen your, uh, your computer at home, the transfer will automatically resume. Uh, if there's some network issues uh, when transferring file between two supercomputers, uh, again, uh, Globus will uh, resume the transfer. So it's very convenient. But uh, for a small text file, I would prefer SCP or SFTP. When uh, we're talking uh, hundreds of megabytes or terabytes, uh, then we would, uh, I would, I would prefer Globus as also it's more efficient when transferring file. It's really using all the available bandwidth, uh, when transferring file. So you will make, this will make sure that, uh, you get, uh, the file as fast as possible to its destination. Uh, to conclude that training, we, uh, at Calcul Quebec and Compute Canada, we offer a vast amount of training. So this, uh, introduction to Compute Canada servers and high performance computing is part of our training, but we offer, uh, all sorts of, uh, other, uh, other courses. Most of our courses now are based on software carpentry. We are all software carpentry, uh, instructors. But if you have special needs regarding Hadoop, Spark, uh, special stuff for your groups, uh, you can uh, ask for it. And Calcul Quebec is currently uh, aiming to give at least, from what I understand, at least one uh, virtual training per week, starting at least, I think, next week. Uh, most of our training is, are done in French. Uh, but, and you can follow, and you can find out uh, about those training follow by uh, looking at our websites or our Twitter, or we also have a Hevenbright. I don't know how they're going to proceed 
with the announcement of the virtual training, don't know if they are going to use Eventbrite or not, but uh, you can be sure that once you are also once you have your Compute Canada account, you will also get all sorts of news about trainings and stuff. And you can always also look at the Twitter and I, we also have a Facebook page. So you can look at a Facebook page if you'd like to, to know about our trains. Uh, and this is uh, the slides regarding how to install a Clover Sandpoint. Uh, I'm going to take the next 15 minutes maybe uh, just to demonstrate a few uh, cool things. And I, I, I said to JB that I would introduce you to my binder in Binder Hub. So I'm going to take the next uh, 15 minutes to do that. And this should leave us 10 minutes for open questions. And then I'll be uh, available until probably 5.30 if you have questions on the hands on uh, through Slack or something. Does that sound good, Elizabeth, JB? That sounds perfect. Thanks a lot, All right. Uh, All right. Uh, I had a question. So I had a question on Jupyter Hub. Could we, could we, uh, Jupyter, could we run Jupyter Notebook uh, on, on the, uh, on Computer Canada Cluster? If I go on brain.calcoquebec.cloud, oh, so uh, the virtual cluster also has uh, a Jupyter Hub that allow you to launch notebook on the, uh, on the cluster. And the actual software uh, deploy on the virtual cluster is the same that will be deployed on the Compute Canada cluster and that is currently deployed on Beluga in Alias. So if you go to, uh, I, have named, I haven't named uh, Alias, but if you go on jupyterhub.alias.calculquebec.ca and you have a Compute Canada account, uh, Elias is our uh, is Calcul Quebec first uh, GPU uh, second big GPU only uh, cluster uh, that is currently used by uh, it's it's quite old but it's not that old but for GPU it's old uh, it's uh, K80s uh, Nvidia K80s GPUs uh, but. It's one of our first deployment of Jupyter Hub, but the same software is also running on, uh, on brain.calculquebec.cloud. So you can actually log in using username and password. Now, if you are quicker than me, please refrain from submitting a notebook job right now, uh, I, just so I can do my demo without having to cancel your job. All right, so this is what it will look like on Beluga and this is what it currently looks like on Alias. So when you log in on uh, the Jupyter Hub for uh, a Compute Canada cluster that is coming, uh, what you get is actually a form with the different parameters that we uh, normally provide through a submit script. So instead, it's a more convenient uh, interface uh, where you uh, will get all your accounts directly. You will get uh, the amount of wall time that you need. Uh, the number of cores is uh, also, the, the limits on the number of cores is also automatically fetched uh, based on the cluster limits. And same thing for the amount of, of memory. Uh, if the cluster had a uh, add GPUs available, you would find uh, GPUs under the GPU configuration form. And uh, you can use uh, different uh, UI uh, user interface. So you can launch classical Jupyter Notebook, or you can launch uh, Jupyter Lab, or even if you just want a terminal, uh, we can redirect you directly to the Jupyter Notebook terminal. Uh, so for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to use uh, Jupyter Lab. All right. So what? Uh, so what happened is 
the form actually submitted a slurm job since there was no one in the queue because you are all very polite and you actually follow what I said. Uh, you did not launch any jobs, so there was uh, enough room in the actual uh, in the actual queue to launch the job. Uh, we now uh, there is no waiting time. We were redirected directly to a Jupyter notebook. If we were in the waiting queue, and if they had been jobs in the waiting queue, uh, we would have wait until there is some uh, resources available, and then eventually uh, we would then we would have been redirected to the Jupyter Lab interface. Or uh, if the amount of waiting time had exceeded five minutes, unfortunately, that job would have been canceled. Uh, those, uh, that small caveat is being worked on. Uh, we are trying to, on Beluga, we are trying to open uh, more resources uh, to interactive jobs through notebooks. But you get the idea, this is the same, uh, the same interface that you will get. So, uh small uh we have seen module through the command line in jupyter lab and in jupyter notebook we also have the same modules available so for example if i'd like to work with uh ipython uh 3.8 notebook i can load the ipython 3.8 kernel and if i launch this As you can see, the uh, launcher has automatically updated to 3.8. So if I launch 3.8, I can look at import sys. If I do sys.version, I have 3.8. So I can launch, so, so I can choose whatever Python kernel I need. Uh, I could load, if for example, I would prefer to use RStudio, I can actually load our studio. Our studio is going to appear in my uh, in my interface, so I can launch our studio here. I can even launch, for example, Open Refine. And the latest addition to uh, our Jupyter Lab is that you can actually launch a VNC desktop session. So if your uh, if this, uh, these interfaces uh, do not, uh, th the software that you would like to use is only available as an X window, we can launch a old, a old desktop. So if I launch the desktop, and the reason it's taking some time is that currently the software is not, so I have RStudio here. The reason it's taking some time, is, as I said, all of our software is made available on all of our supercomputers, but only on demand. So what we do when staff install software, we don't install software directly on the cluster. We actually install software on a uh, repo that is central to all clusters. And when a user actually access that software uh, by accessing the, the different paths, the software is downloaded automatically to the cluster and uh, eventually it, after a small uh, downloading time, it appears on the cluster and made available. So all of this is transparent to the user. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to be aware of it, but it's just to explain that uh, it took some time to actually launch the desktop, but actually all of this desktop binaries uh, that is currently made available here. And I can launch access to it. I could launch calculator, for example. All of that software was not on the virtual cluster until I asked for it. So all of that ran in the background, in the back end, and made available. And now I can actually run a high performance calculator uh, through a desktop. Now, we would agree this is not high performance computing, uh, but uh, the, uh, the desktop is the, a last resort solution when, for example, you would like to use MATLAB or a uh, visualization tool. So 
those interactive jobs could be launched for could be used for example to launch uh, a tool called pair view so i can launch a terminal in on my desktop i can load pair view so pair view is a 3d visualization tool uh, that is pretty evident and we actually provide training on on pair view uh well i'll skip that but i could have uh something is missing for peer view Because the default GCC is not right. Sorry about that. Now I can launch pair view. Okay, so I have a web browser launching Jupyter Lab, launching a desktop, launching a UI uh, to do 3D visualization, and all of that is being done like there's very small latency and all of that virtual cluster is actually in BC in University of Victoria so uh, it's uh, it's pretty pretty cool uh, so Felix Antoine do we need to watch uh, inception before we can <laughs> that's, that's a good question uh, but yeah, it's just to give you a, a no, an overview, but uh, you, you don't have to go to as far as launching desktop or uh, I, I could probably launch a second uh, browser accessing Jupyter. I, I, oh, okay. Uh, but uh, you can, so you can launch classical notebook and you can, but you can go as far as actually launching desktop application. And all of that is going to be made available on our supercomputers uh, in the coming months. That is really awesome. Uh, do, you, do you mind what is, uh, telling us again how you chose uh, Python 3 versus uh, R versus uh, where the, uh, yeah. where is this, um, this choice is uh, on yeah. the interface? Uh, if you, uh, so in Lab, if you go in, uh, if you launch a, if you create a, what they call a new launcher, uh, and this is, uh, this is, uh, specific to our compute Canada setup. We have this little cube, uh, that allow us to interact with the software, the, the module, uh, command. And in the search box, you can look for a currently available module. So for example, uh, the different kernels are under IPython kernels. So if I'd like to use IPython kernel uh, 3.7 instead of 3.8, I can just click here on load. And automatically the default kernel will be replaced by 3.7 instead of 3.8. So when I launch my notebook, it's at some point, it's going to, and I look at the version, it's going to be 3.7.4. Uh, the the, it's the same. So in this case, I already, if I unload our studio, our studio disappear. But if I look for our studio server in the search box, uh, I have two version available. So I can go for the last version. And if I wanted to actually use a different version of R, 
I could have loaded uh, 3.6.1 instead of uh, 4 and launched R Studio. That's that's awesome. Uh, so this is so again, this is for interactive jobs, but you get the actual power of a single potentially a single node on a compute candle cluster. So it could mean also you could, uh, if you had access to a GPU uh, in, in that cluster, you could ask for, for that GPU to do some interactive experimentation directly on the cluster. Uh, as I said, this is the 3D software uh, thing. Uh, and now, so this was to answer the notebook question. Uh, and we'll look at, so you've seen Docker files and uh, Git repo too. Uh, there's a thing that's awesome that was uh, developed at UC Berkeley that is called Binder. So if you're working with notebooks and uh, potentially Docker files and you would like uh, to share a live, uh, a live, uh, I would say that, a live version of that repo. So uh, you would like to, to share your notebook and let people actually interact with that notebook. Uh, just by publishing your notebook or uh, your software on, uh, on GitHub is not sufficient, right? In order to interact with your notebook or your software, people have to first pull uh, the Git repo and uh, install the different uh, requirements. Or if you have provided a Docker file, they will have first to either download the, the Docker image or uh, build the Docker image from your Docker file. With Binder, the idea is to limit that amount of requirements to a bare minimum being just, just share the URL to your Git repo and Binder will actually build the Docker file, the Docker image, potentially make it available in a repo and then make that Docker image alive in, a, uh, in an environment that the user can actually interact with. All of that to a simple form uh, available at mybinder.org. So mybinder.org is a, the, public, uh, uh, the, the public installation of a project called BinderHub that does everything that I've described. Uh, so you could, you could deploy your own instance of BinderHub, for example. But uh, my binder is the idea is you just input your a Git repo and you will get a, uh, you, you will get in exchange a, uh, in a live uh, Jupyter notebook that helps you uh, enter that, that let you interact with, uh, with with the different notebooks. And to give an example, I'm going to try to. So, Calcul Quebec has some. Uh, so here in uh, in my binder, you want to provide a URL to a Git repo. Uh, in Calcul Quebec, we have some. We do have some uh, some formation. So, for example, if I'd like to interact with my uh, create a in a live web page where I have a notebook that can interact with the uh, notebooks for my Spark formation, what I would have to do is just go on my uh, Git repo regarding uh, regarding Spark, build and launch a repository. So even if my repo does not include a Docker file. Uh, it's still going to create a base on, on a basic Docker image with Jupyter Notebook and launch a Jupyter Notebook with all my files available for the user to interact with. So, uh, and I can specify a Git branch or a Git commit if I like to use something different than master. And I could specify the path directly to the notebook if I want to open the notebook directly instead of Jupyter Notebook in general. So I'm going to just click on launch. And what's very cool is that once you uh, en enter your, 
your URL, uh, if that URL is actually your own Git repo, uh, MyBinder actually provides a button that you could add to your readme. So people could visit your, uh, your GitHub page and uh, find that little button. And when they click on it, they are being redirected I, uh, to mybinder.org. The image is built and eventually they are being redirected to a live version of your repo where they can interact uh, with uh, through Jupyter Notebook. So this is the markdown uh, code that you would have to uh, that you would have to copy in your uh, in your readme in order to have this uh, small button appear. Uh, you might have uh, if you have done some some work in machine learning or with uh, Google Collab, you might have seen a similar a similar button button uh, called like uh, I think launch it Collab. Uh, please note that Binder did it first and. Collab just copied it. Uh, where... Okay, I've forgot to actually click on launch. Launching server. Yes. All right, so now I have a notebook with uh, entirely for free running currently if i look at the address it's currently running on google cloud without me inputting anything but uh just know that mybinder.org actually got some uh some interest from other uh other other research groups and other companies and uh ovh and google and i think another uh company or another research group actually provide resources for my binder to actually launch those containers. So we started with a Git repo with my uh, static uh, notebooks. But if I return on this page, I'm now having a whole Jupyter notebook where I can actually work with the notebook and execute the different cells. So that's, that's pretty cool. And that's just by inputting a and any GitHub repo will work, uh, but there are different uh, files that you can add to your repo to make sure that, for example, if you add a requirements.txt, all of the Python packages will be installed first uh, before uh, redirecting the user to the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you could also define, for example, a Docker file uh, if you'd like to spawn actually a different software than Jupyter Notebook. So you can, uh, if we, I can't remember. Uh, Jupyter, um, So for example, there is a repo for the extension of uh, Jupyter that allows to launch RStudio directly in Jupyter and Jupyter Lab. Uh, in the readme of that, that extension, there's a launch binder, uh, there's a launch binder button that redirects to a, uh, a binder version where you actually have RStudio directly in, in Jupyter. So you can find this button a bit everywhere on mostly on Jupyter projects, but it doesn't necessarily have to be Jupyter. In the end, it, if it's different than a notebook, all you have to do is define a Docker file and uh, make sure that the last command is actually uh, outputting a web page that can, that binder can redirect to. So it's, uh, it's a very neat project with a lot of potential. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's about what I have to say about Binder and all my stuff. And we are, it's 4.30. Thank you so much, uh, Felix Antoine. I think it's, it's been a, yeah, it's been a, 
really, really, really nice afternoon. Uh, extremely informative, extremely well explained. Uh, we've left lots of information, I think, for both people starting with a, uh, with a you know, large comp uh, computing and, uh, and also people, even to people who have actually a little bit of experience or will be, have uh, gotten some things out of it as well. So it's, uh, it's really, uh, really awesome. So I, I just want to say a big, a big thank you.